Without further ado, because we stay on schedule, Felipe is here uh, from uh, from Portland uh, by way of uh, France, from what I understand, and he is going to talk to to talk to us about uh, breaking into embedded devices, including phones, uh, phones that you might have on your desk at work, phones that might be. I'm not even going to get into that. Phones that might be around. Let's learn about embedded device hacking. Let's give Felipe a big round of applause. Have a good time, man. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Um, so yeah, I'm really excited to be here. It's like a big honor. And um, yeah, so today we're going to talk about hardware hacking, and um, I'm going to share like, this introduction to it, and I hope um, I can share some love about um, hardware hacking. So uh, who am I? I'm Philippe Lorvet. Um I'm a senior security researcher at McAfee um, Advanced Threat Research. So I, I do um, software and hardware vulnerability research, and you can find me on Twitter at phlol. Before joining McAfee, I spent two years doing um, embedded security, and before that, I was a C++ dev. So I'm more coming from a um, software background, actually. So you could wonder, like, why should you care about um, hardware hacking in the first place, right? Um, I can see like two main reasons. Uh, first, it's like it's actually really fun and empowering to be able to um, you know break, up, break open like a device that you like have in your home at work whatever. And instead of considering that it's a black box, you can instead you know like start poking at it and understanding how it works. And then in a more like pragmatic way. Um, if, if we consider like security in the past couple of years, uh, software is becoming much and much uh, harder to like break. Like if you try to, uh, I know, like pawn like a, uh, whatever like um, embedded device like a web server, like find, finding a vuln in a web server by itself is kind of hard. But if instead you can just like open the device, solder a couple of wires, and get like a shell from that, that's much easier. So uh, hardware hacking is great because it's also like a lot of uh, low hanging fruits basically. So uh, today we're going to talk about uh, Avaya phones, um, and especially like the uh, the phone picture on the right side of the slide is a 9611G model. Uh, so Avaya is like one of the biggest uh, VoIP um, solution provider. You can find them like all over the place. Uh, it covers like 90% of the Fortune 100 company, and I think that specific model of phone started in 2006 and is going to be end of life, like at the end of the year or something. And the funny, um, on the bottom right of my slide, there is this uh, funny like um, screenshot from uh, like a firmware download page from like a really old soft, uh, firmware for these phones, where um, actually like you can see that um, you can only download that specific firmware if you're like a DOD, DOD customer. So um, basically, you can see that these phones are like going to a lot of different places. So uh, regarding prior art uh, in hardware hacking, so there's like a lot of information nowadays on the internet. Like you can find a lot of blog posts, tutorials. Um, there is like the hardware hacking village that you all go sh uh, go and check out. Uh, CTF as well, where you can like practice uh, like kind of like the software side of stuff. And um, on my slides, I like a bunch of links at the end, uh, so you can like download the slides at later time and um, also do slides. Uh, I've like the, the one I've uploaded have like more text on them, so it's like more like standalone. So you can read more. Um, and yeah, uh, Red Balloon Security uh, found like two RCs in the same uh, phone, uh, something like five years ago or something. Um, and they had like a talk at RSA called Stepping Pawns that I would also recommend to check out online. So uh, for the next 40 minutes, um, so I'm going to talk about um, hardware hacking and use that phone as a base to like support that conversation. Um, and basically, the idea of like the whole situation is. Um, uh, like a couple of like 12 years ago, maybe uh, Avaya forked some open source code, and um, they never applied security patches to that. And um, it turns out that like me by poking at the device, I found that, and it was like remained like unnoticed for like 10 years that there was like actually like a CVE that got released like yeah 10 years ago for DEFCON. So I'm going to talk about uh, how I found that, like that it was like some stupid like vulnerable code inside the firmware. But more interesting, I think, is uh, talking about the whole process. You know, like how I did it um, and why I did what I did it. When, oops, sorry, why I did stuff I did when I did it. Um, you know, like basically like sharing um, the process so that, and you know, also like sharing. Uh, you know, what if the stuff I tried didn't work, or also like share like stuff that didn't work because, you know, what what works for one device might not work for another. And having just like that mental model of what you can do and what you cannot. Uh, helps you a lot approaching like any kind of device, and that's I really think why I want people to take away from that talk is more like um, learning the process so that you can check out like whatever device you have. And yeah, I would want to like insist that um, if I can do it, I think everyone in this room can do it as well. As I said, I'm more from like software background, and the hardware hacking is still like you know like a um, little scary, little foreign to me. But it's in the end, it's really not that hard if you have like a good process and 
you know, be, work with patients. So uh, how did the whole project start? Um, uh, to be honest, I was like, you know, working at work and there were like all these cubicles and on every desk I see this like phone like standing on, on the desk. I'm like, wait a minute, these phones run Linux, they have, you know, network access, they have like mics and stuff. It's like, how, how secure is that? You know, like, you know, you, you wonder like, what's up with it? Did people consider the security of those? So um, the first step before, you know, even like I start like stealing my coworkers' phone and breaking it apart, you can, like, and that's the general step is uh, you can check out the FCC website. Usually like any device that has Wi-Fi or Bluetooth has to be um, on the FCC website for a like, compliance reason. So that's what I found. Um, that's not my phone. That's like a other model of like same brand basically and like really close. So you see all these cool pictures, but more interesting is the, um, the inside of the phone. Uh, so we can enhance it, and um, on the left side in, right, in red, um, I've highlighted like this like random debug connector. I don't know what it is, but that's interesting to see that's there. And on the right side, um, there is like that like um, in purple, there is that flash memory. So that's usually where the file system of the phone is going to be stored. And the whole point of that is just to get an idea of what to expect, you know, before even approaching a real target like buying hardware and stuff, so that. Um, you, you know like if it's going to be an easy target or a hard target. Uh, you know if everything was covered in black epoxy that would be harder. So uh, another important step is like faking, um, get, getting like um, online material like um, you know um, marketing brochure so you have an idea of what the fun, what are the fun capabilities and the ecosystem surrounding it. So that you have an idea of um, you know like the attack surface. And you can also find like user manuals and stuff. And for instance, I found that one that was pretty cool. It's like a user, like our advanced user manual that says, oh, if you want a serial connection to the phone, you need that funky box. And uh, yeah, which is interesting. It, teach, it, it tell us that, yeah, you can find a serial connection and you may have some special hardware for that, but are we going to see that in a bit? And uh, after that, you also want to check like forums and um, so that you can find like what poor users are doing. Like for instance, I found like the default password for the phone in, uh, debug interface because um, and system admin so, uh, talk, uh, are talking about that online. And uh, if you're lucky, you can also download the firmware of an ID of uh, WhatsApp there. And I will cover that in a minute. Okay, so uh, what do we do now? Uh, now we have an idea of like what it might look inside. This is a hardware hacking talk, so we're going to avoid warranties. And so the point is like you open the phone first. Um, and the trick is like usually you always expect to find the same stuff inside. And uh, if you look at the labels of the components, you will see uh, you, and you Google that, uh, you will find out like what it is. So for instance, that's my phone, and um, you can see in the center the CPU up above it, like the RAM, in like a lavender-ish color, like some unpopulated like header that I marked with a question mark. This, I think the same header as the one we were like seeing in the picture before and uh, it might be JTAG, I did not have to use it so I don't know actually. Uh, in purple we have like the EEPROM so that's uh, would hold like some settings and stuff. Uh, in dark blue in the bottom of the, um, of the slide is like a key, the RG45. So I was kind of confused when I was looking at that and I didn't know even the term for it. And the idea is just a regular RG45 uh, like Ethernet plug but with a weird um, connector so that you cannot plug the wrong stuff into it. Um, and uh, more interesting in yellow, uh, the UART. So it's, UART is kind of like the serial console and um, we have like this exposed like uh, pads and so usually like in manufacturing or something you would have like uh, pogo pins that would like directly connect to the pads and that's, uh, that one is actually really interesting because you would find like serial, you would expect to find a serial console on that. And on the back uh, we can see the same NAND flash uh, that we've seen in the previous picture and um, yeah from that it's like where the file system would be like stored on, on the device. So okay, you have, um, you, we looked at the stuff inside and the, like other things that are interesting to look at is like test points and debug headers. So and like basically all these kind of stuff that are not components and you can ask why would you expect to find them inside? And a couple of reasons, like one is like just, usually like the dev board that the, the guys are going to use is the same as the production board and maybe they're not, just not going to solder the debug components. It's the same as if you had like software and it was built with like debug symbols for instance. And um, also like part of the manufacturing process, um, you, this test points and stuff might be used for like flashing the device or making sure that it's flashed properly. And sometimes you know like something died on, um, in, in, the, in the real world and they want to like do a post mortem to understand what happened and that's useful as well. So what kind of stuff you want to look for in that situation? You want to look at UART that we were like looking at before, JTAG that I'm going to 
uh, covering like in a minute. And then like you can also have like random test points that are chilling there like all over the all over the table uh, all over the board. And there might be like long test points say, like label like TP1, TP2, whatever. And sometimes uh, that might be like not interesting to you, but sometimes you can find interesting stuff like um, you might find that like oh if you short like TP64 uh, with ground, it's going to reset the device, which might be actually useful in some extent. So uh, looking at UART, uh, so as I said, it's for like serial connection. Uh, it comes in like three or four pins. The three pins would be um, ground, uh, transmit, and receive. And the fourth pin would be like VCC, so three volt, five volt, whatever. And usually you don't care about that one. You don't even want to plug it. You don't have to. And might, uh, yeah. And um, the, the trick to know is um, the serial console uh, sends data at different speed. And there are only like a couple of, it's called like baud rate. And there's only like a few uh, common baud rate values. So if you try to plug you, your system in, uh, into the UART and you just see gibberish on screen, the, probably the reason is you just have the baud rate wrong and you could just like try to cycle through like all the possi possible one and you would find something eventually, I think. Um, JTAG is another one that's um, interesting. Um, so that's for like hardware debugging and with that you could like, you know, uh, debug the CPU usually and execute like uh, instruction by instruction and whatnot. And it, they come in many different uh, shapes, number of pins and whatnot. So some example like on the bottom of the slide. Uh, but actually only a couple of wires are interesting and uh, at the end of the slides I'll like, link to like a Senryo article about like understanding JTAG better. But basically like if you look on the top right side uh, of my slides there is like a dev board and there's like a nice uh, JTAG connector like plugged there. And on the other hand like on the bottom right it's like some uh, random device I was looking at which you can see there should be a JTAG but it's never being soldered on and so I had to solder directly onto that stuff. And the trick to remember here if you kind of like solder your own connector is uh, you actually may have to co add like extra resistors called like pull up and pull down resistors that connects like one pin to ground or one pin to like VCC. And the point of that is, actually I don't know the point of that, but the, the reason is like if you don't have them it might not work well uh, or it's more work most of the time it's going to be glitchy. So um, and if you follow the uh, instruction from like, uh, for instance like an uh, ARM as specification for like what resistor you need, so you might skip them but then you might waste time like understanding why it's uh, weird, weirdly like fucked up sometimes. So I would recommend like remember the pull up and pull down resistors. So that's just a random board that my coworker was looking at uh, just to show you that what I said is actually fairly generic. Uh, on the left side we have like UART, on the right side is like some JTAG connectors. Uh, up there is the um, upright there is like the main CPU whatever that's under like a shield and usually you do that for um, preventing um, interferences so it's like a Wi-Fi module so that's why. And the cool thing to know is usually the shield is grounded so like if you're looking for the ground on your thing like either the shield on that kind of stuff or like the casing around the ethernet port or whatever is also uh, actually like fairly useful. So uh, now that we learn how to uh, look into stuff, we need to know what hardware you need for um, interfacing with what's inside. So I'm going to present like a bunch of uh, cool hacking tool set that's important. So the first one, uh, you may want this pin or like the stickers. I don't know if you're familiar with that, but um, the actually like what's really important is like safety. Um, so you know, don't work with stuff that's plugged in the wall. Uh, remember to unplug stuff. Work in like well ventilated room. It's important. And uh, yeah, just don't be stupid when you're like uh, messing with hardware. Uh, but yeah. So next, a uh, picture from the lab. Uh, I'm holding um, soldering iron. You can usually switch tip for like if you have like, a large tip for like big soldering and tiny ones for small soldering. I have a microscope, so that's really useful for doing uh, tiny soldering. And the trick is, I, I tend to drink a lot of coffee and I shake, so I'm, I would I was thinking like I wouldn't do that. But actually, if you um if you're careful, and the, the trick is like really like try to um you know when you're soldering like try to hold your arm like straight and well grounded. And under the microscope, you can actually do a lot of stuff that you shouldn't think you you wouldn't be able to you sh you would think you shouldn't be able to do it, but you actually actually can. <sighs> Sorry. Um, Top right side, um, it's what I actually use for doing tiny soldering and um, it's like top right is like flux. So it's kind of um, magic glue, magic uh, gooey st substance that you put on um, pins to uh, when you're soldering surface mount or pads so that it works really well. So don't, never forget flux. Uh, bottom is um, so like in the same uh, size like uh, copper wires, like an um, enameled wire that you use usually for making coils, you know, for like radio or whatever. 
Um, and the trick is like the, the wire is actually um, coated in uh, varnish so it doesn't uh, short and you can use that to do like really tiny point to point like soldering and that's actually really useful. And just next to it you have like some desoldering wick so like the idea is if you put too much solder and you fuck it up, uh, you can put the wick on top of the solder blob that you messed up with and you um, put the soldering iron on top of that, it's going to get really hot so you want to hold it through like the plastic casing and it's going to uh, absorb all the like extra solder and you can clean up your stuff. And then I put like a picture of like some random like uh, jumper wires that are, are usually always useful to have. And uh, on the bottom right I have like that crazy uh, heat gun uh, which is like 60 bucks at Home Depot. It's meant to like help paint dry or something, I'm not sure but it's actually really useful for like, if you're on the chip, if you want to remove components by just like hitting them and pulling them off. So um, more uh, cool hardware, um, that's a multimeter. Um, if you're not familiar with that, it's, you used it for um, finding voltage of chip you wouldn't know like what's the actual voltage so the black goes to ground and the, with the red you uh, with the white probe you start like poking around to uh, measure the voltage. And the other really cool stuff is you can set it in continuity mode and when you have like connection between the two probes it beeps. So if you do like crappy soldering job as I was describing just before, you can make sure that you actually did a proper job where like everything is connected the way you think by you know making sure that both like when you probe like both sides it actually beeps. And that's actually a fairly useful uh, tool. The other one is this is a logic analyzer. Uh, the name is like a Sally. Um, that's a brand. And the idea is the same as in software. You have like ways of communicating between process. Like in hardware, you have like ways of communicating between chips or the CPU and the chip. And it's, uh, it's like a lot of different standards, different ways of doing stuff. But the logic analyzer like knew a lot of them, and it's going to convert like a bunch of signals that are going onto wires into actual data. And that's actually really useful. That would be your eyes, like when you're doing uh, debugging, you know. And that's like a snapshot of like some spy communication, uh, which spy is just some random protocol. Uh, that's like an FTDI cable, also come in many, uh, or serial cable, it comes in many different shapes and stuff. And the idea is just like when you want to do like UART, you, you plug that into your laptop and you connect the, the other side to like the UART port and you get like a console, it shows up at a serial port. And uh, as an example, I have um, on the bottom right, um, like a Raspberry Pi, that's, you can actually get a serial console and you don't need like HDMI cable or anything to interface with that. Whew. Um, the Bus Pirate, uh, also like cool device. Um, it does, um, it, it's kind of dependent of the hardware hacking, uh, the, sorry, the, um, the Sally, the logic analyzer. So instead of absorbing data, it's like send data, so it speaks a bunch of different protocol and you can use Python to uh, program it. So it's extremely useful if you want to like read flash, program um, microcontrollers and that kind of stuff. Uh, more cool stuff like about, I was talking about JTAG, that's the JTAG debuggers that you, that's why you would plug actually like the, the JTAG port on. They come in many different like uh, price range and whatnot. So on the bottom right is a fly swatter, it's like probably like 30 bucks I think. And it works okay and uh, above it's like a J-Link which is uh, more fancy. And the idea is like the more expensive the stuff is, the more, the, probably the more reliable it is and it comes with like better software and whatnot. And on the bottom right the pink board is a JTAGulator that uh, Joe Grant, the same guy who made like those badges, uh, made. And it's really awesome. So um, if you have like that board, you don't know what it is and there's like a bunch of test points and you're like, I bet there is some JTAG somewhere in it but you don't know where. You can just wire like all the test points to the JTAGulator and it's going to brute force like and try to find everything. So it's really cool. Um, another interesting, important tool is uh, flash readers. So um, usually flash contain, uh, the flash has the file system and stuff. And um, so you want to like interface with that. And uh, it comes in two flavor, I guess. You can do like in circuit stuff. So you have like either like a little like clamp that you put on the chip or like the little rectangular one um, and the clip on. Um, so like the Raspberry Pi is a good one for that. And on the top right is like a flash cat. Uh, it's like useful for the rectangular one. Um, but you can also like choose to like actually desolder the chip and in that case you would have like some like little like socket adapter so you can clip the chip on and then you plug it into your flash card or whatever and it's going to read it. And I will cover like why, what's, what's, why it's important like both in a, in a minute. And finally it's kind of the um, last uh, hope. So let's say uh, you know your flash is encrypted, there is no UART, there is no firmware. So you can try to do like the more crazy stuff like fault injection and side channel attack. So that's a chip whisperer, so like more like a kind of hard, more badass device. And the idea with that is um, it, it, you can do stuff like um, 
you, you uh, wire it and to the, the CPU and you're going to drop the power on the CPU for like a split second and it's going to like mess up some instruction and you can bypass checks and stuff. That's what people use for like gaming console hacking and, and um, that kind of stuff. So uh, what do we do now? Um, that we have an idea of what's inside the phone and um, you know um, the tools we can use. So like I think there's three pot potential track. One is messing with the UART, so the serial console. Another one is uh, messing with the flash and trying to recover the firmware or something and then maybe you can just download the firmware online. And the three are like valid approach and sometimes it's good to just go from one to another to another and you know wh whenever you find like some hurdle you can like go from one to another. Uh, so I went for the UART first and that's what I'm greeted at by when I connect my FTDI cable to the UART port that uh, I was showing before. So um, we can see like on the left side the um, the console thing it's like dot 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 usually when you see that you can press space or escape and it's going to interrupt the booting process of the phone. And in that situation uh, but somehow here it didn't work and uh, I will cover that why in a minute. And on the top right side of the slide um, we can see like it read something from the EEPROM and it decided to set the console to dev null. So you don't want console to be dev null because it, that goes nowhere but that's interesting to know that uh, there is some potential there. And finally it says like booting Linux so it con uh, confirms that it's a, a Linux board but then uh, there is nothing more uh, after that. So that's some good thing, bad things. So the problems are like nothing shows up after like the Linux is as booted, probably because of the dev null situation. And when I press key, it's not working, and uh, I'm going to like come up with like why that happened. So at that point, I was stuck. I was like, okay, I, I cannot go anywhere. So I'm going to try to recover the firmware to try to understand what's up with that. Uh, multiple ways of recovering firmwares. Uh, it's like an easy way. It's like you can download it online. And actually that worked. Um, there is like some cool snapshot of that. Uh, sometimes it's encrypted. Uh, on our case it wasn't. Um, but yeah, so you can also try to sniff a firmware update. Uh, that's really useful for IoT devices in general. And you can use a network tap, which is like the thing pictured on the top right of the slide. Um, or you can mirror your port on your switch or whatever. Uh, the problem with all of that is oftentimes the firmware update is going to do over like HTTPS or it might be and in this case you're like stuck. And then you want to go for like a more like uh, hardware hacking stuff or like you're going to dump a flash for instance. And there's like even more advanced technique that I will briefly like uh, talk about. So uh, how do you dump a flash? There is two ways as I was mentioning just before. You can do in circuit programming and um, out of circuit. So in circuit is cool because you don't have to you know like remove stuff, break stuff. But there are a couple of issues with that. Um, the main idea is to read the flash. You need to power the flash. And if you if it's like still plugged in into the whole system, uh, it, when you're like Raspberry Pi, for instance, going to try to read the flash, it's going to try to power like everything else that's connected to the same like you know bus line uh, power line. And either you know your Raspberry Pi is not strong enough to power like a VoIP phone, which you would expect. And in that case, uh, but it's just not going to work. Or maybe your Raspberry Pi is really strong <laughs> and it's going to do it. But then the problem is the CPU starts booting and it's going to talk with the flash and that's going also to mess up your stuff. So in that situation, you have like two choices usually. Either you can try to like lift up the pin, the power pin, so that it doesn't happen. Or you can kind of go a little more like YOLO approach where um, you want to keep the CPU in reset. So I've been successful with that many times where I just like start like trying to ground like random test points of stuff on the board praying that it's not going to fry anything and usually I, at some point like I'm going to notice that okay when I do that the phone like light up but doesn't boot that's good. And maybe better ways you can disorder the chip with like the big like heat gun and whatnot. You have to be careful though because if you like pull it too hard you might like bend pins and it's going to be like useless. Um, but a good trick to know is like you can make a little like um, tin foil a hat or whatever like around the chip so that like when you're heating up the chip like the stuff around it doesn't like get too hot uh, so you don't like, accidentally like knock off like some like tiny like components that would be like a pain in the butt to um, put back. And uh, bottom right is like I was I was I thought I would have to do that on the phone so I wanted to practice first and I just took like some random uh, USB thumb drive and I tried. And actually that worked really f nice but the trick is to remember I like, also put some flux because it helps. And uh, yeah, just don't be careful with when you pull it off. A few other tricks that actually didn't work on this one, but are good to know. Uh, U-boot is the most common bootloader, uh, not used here, but it's you would find that on pretty much every other device. And the idea is you can also interrupt the boot process of that and ask nicely U-boot, hey, can you load the flash in memory? And then uh, U-boot is also able to dump in a hex, like in the screen. Um, the, the memory so this way you can just like write a little script to do that and recover everything from the flash which is really cool. But usually like dev don't like letting you do that so they set, they lock that approach so, so you cannot like press space to interrupt the boot process. 
But there is a trick that I also call like the YOLO approach where um, instead when the idea is like U-boot is going to load from the flash like the, the Linux kernel or something. But if while it's happening you start like poking with you know like a, a wire that's connecting to ground or you start like poking the NAND flash like some of the pins. It's going to mess up like what uh, U-boot is reading. And after a couple of tries uh, U-boot is going to be like damn uh, that kernel is fucked up I don't know what to do and it's going to give you like a shell. So that's really cool. But yeah as I said that one wouldn't work on our phone unfortunately. But uh, just some cool example that I found online where like some guy actually did that. And uh, I underline in, uh, in like purple on the bottom like the command you need to use to like load the, f the, the flash in memory. And on the right side this like little block of text is um, sorry is how uh, U-boot is panicking and be like eh I don't know how to do with your kernel and give you the, the shell. So um, how, um, so a few more like tricks for um, Dump, dumping the flash, so you can use JTAG. So usually you have, uh, if JTAG works, you're going to uh, be able to um, dump the RAM. So in this case, that wouldn't be really like dumping the flash; that would be more dumping the firmware. But in a lot of devices, it's going to load the whole stuff in memory. So if you can dump the memory, you are you, you're the same. It's, you're pretty good there. And kind of the last hope, but that's that's one of my favorite about hardware hacking is you can do crazy uh, stuff. Um, and an example is uh, Scanlime, um, that person on the internet who uh, she had um, a Wacom tablet. That she wanted to dump the, um, the firmware off, and there was like no attack surface at all. But she realized that like when you it was like USB stuff, so when you plug your USB um, onto the laptop, there is some USB exchange that I don't know anything of. But it sends like USB descriptor, and if you if you glitch the CPU just at that time, um, it's going to like you know miss like a boundary check, and it's going to send way more data. And with that, uh, she was able to recover like the full flash, uh, full memory or something. So it's really impressive. But and that's what's oh, kind of awesome about hardware hacking. Okay, so uh, we recovered the firmware, uh, in my case, just by downloading online, but what do we do now? We want to analyze it. Um, the best tool for that is called Binwalk, and it's just basically a magic dictionary that's going to like look at your binary blob of stuff and be like, hmm, halfway through it looks like there is a zip file, I'm going to try to extract it. It tries, maybe it works, maybe it doesn't, depending if it was actually a zip file or not. And it does that for everything. And uh, it might also find like compressed file system, uh, such as like SquashFS, GFFS2, etc. And sometimes, like your um, your firmware file might just start with like health headers or just like random like ARM code that you could like look at. So I run binwalk on the, so that's the firmware file I've downloaded from the website. And once again, it's easy mode. It's just a tar file, and they already like split it up into boot one, boot two, and gffs two. So like binwalk has nothing to do here really, and I can just extract the whole file system. And that's cool because from there I can look at what's on the phone just like that. Uh, but the more interesting use case for Binwalk is I took like a different uh, firmware file for like uh, another Avaya phone, and this one is way more interesting because Binwalk finds like a way more lo lot of stuff, and uh, I've highlighted like you find the file system and is able to extract it, and there's also that random like MySQL stuff which I think is a false positive. Then you need to be aware that there will be a lot of false positives, so don't blindly trust what Binwalk says. And uh, really, really funny stuff that I was looking at. Uh, if you run strings on that specific image, um, you will find like U boot strings. So that phone is using U boot, and the cool stuff I was describing before would actually work on that one. Look. So now that you have extracted the firmware file, what do you want to look for? One of the most uh, interesting stuff is uh, finding the U update mechanism. So assuming you have uh, encrypted firmware, like if you reverse engineer that, you might find the keys and how to, ext to extract like subsequent uh, firmware updates without having to do like any hardware stuff. And then you want to look for like secrets like uh, passwords, certificates, and so on and so forth. Uh, originally my goal was to look at the main binary, so that's the thing that deal with like the VOIP stack. Uh, that would be make sense to look at that. And um, also you want to look at the bootloader because it may have like, hidden commands, uh, explain why our console is not working, that kind of stuff. So remember the point of all of that was I wanted to get a shell on the device and um, what's the process to do that? So the one I want to go for is I want to fix the serial console, you know like the dev null was not cool. Um, but other approach would be like messing with U-boot arguments. Um, not working here, obviously, uh, but you know you can specify the console you want, and uh, the init script can be mar marked as like, oh, I want bin bash as my init script, and then you have a console. Uh, and like kind of last resort stuff that I was considering as well is you could patch the firmware. Uh, in our case, the firmware is signed, so uh, that won't work unless you try to glitch it, which is really hard. But you can also try to patch the file system. So the way Binwalk extracts the GFFS2 stuff, you could modify it and then like repack it and uh, flash it directly onto the flash. And that's usually like a foolproof method like that would work in most cases. 
So instead, I'm going to uh, reverse um, the bootloader. And um, for that, um, because I wanted to understand like why DevNull, uh, con the console was set to DevNull and stuff, I'm not going to cover ARM in much detail and I would recommend you to check out Azaria Labs tutorials that cover everything. But just useful here, um, there is this notion in ARM of literal pool, which is um, inside the code section you would find some little chunk of data and that's usually uh, like used to la load in registries, um, absolute addresses, immediate values, magic offset, that kind of stuff. And uh, FYI, like in, ca in case of function calls, um, the arguments are going to R0 to R3, the return value is in R0, and when you like want to return from your call, it's the, the return address is saved in like the LR register, that stands for like link register. Um, and the big trick, the big problem here is um, we're like trying to load the bootloader, so it's uh, it's not really a elf. So if you try to import it in IDA, IDA doesn't know what to do with it, and so you need to find the loading address for that stuff so it match what where the phone is loading it. Couple of tricks. Um, Sometimes you're lucky and it's going to be printed on screen. That's our case. <laughs> Sweet. Um, but otherwise, we want to look at like header file, uh, headers in the in the bootloader file, or maybe reset vectors. So that stuff where like specifically for ARM, um, like the CPU needs to know uh, specific addresses where like there's like a reset, there's like an interrupt happening, and it's like fairly like um, square, like that how it, that's being set up. So if you find that and you find like what looks like an interrupt vector handler or something, you can find like oh that must be the address. And uh, finally, the little pool I was mentioning, uh, really useful because it's going to contain like absolute addresses or point to strings and stuff. So, uh, if if like you have strings and they look like all fucked up, you probably got the wrong address. And uh, Quark's lab uh, wrote a blog post about it, so I would recommend you checking it out. So, as I said, in our case, it was easy. Um, when it boots, it prints uh, the jump, whatever, and that's actually why you should load it. And um, on the bottom right side, it's like a bunch of uh, strings. Um, so it's a bunch of addresses that point to strings. Uh, that's a snapshot from IDA. And um, we can see that um, it's, like, all the strings like print well, so that means that it's loaded properly. It's not like all messed up. Okay, so now that we have the bootloader and we can like work it with IDA, uh, we want to search for strings. Uh, we were looking at, you know, like that sentence, like EPROM read successful, whatever. So we can use like cross reference in IDA to find where that string is coming from and look at the function that handles that. And uh, yeah, just as a FYI about like EPROM and SPY. So the EPROM that's on the board is called a SPY EPROM, and SPY is just one of those protocols I was mentioning before. EPROM is just uh, like a small memory, uh, whatever. And the SPY uh, protocol is just like four wires, um, and the ID, the CPU is sending command, and the EPROM like reply. And uh, that's a dump from like using the logic analyzer to have a look at what it would look like in real life. Uh, that's the data sheet of the EPROM uh, that you can find on online if you Google the, the label on it. Um, the cool thing is in the uh, bottom left uh, of the slide, it tells you like the pinout, so you know how to connect stuff to it. And on the right side of the slide, um, it tells you which, which opcodes are for like the co uh, spy, com uh, spy command you would send. Like for instance, if you send uh, three, it's going to be a, re a read. If you send two, it's going to be a write. So that's, uh, that's something useful to know, right? Oops, sorry. Back to the um, back to the IDA and uh, the bootloader, we can see uh, the strings we were like looking for, and something extremely promising is we can see the uh, console set to dev null. But above that, there's like a two other option, and it's actually saying like, oh, setting console to like UART zero or UART one. So we want these ones to be printed. Um, that's a that's a function that actually does th print that string. And uh, what it does is uh, roughly uh, clean up, clear some bytes on the stack and then read from EPROM from a magic address and it's going to compare like bytes uh, that has just been read. And if we have the good value, it's going to actually print on the console setting the console for uh, dev TTY uh, AM0. So we want that to happen. Uh, and something you can ask me is like, well, how did you find that read EPROM function, you know? And there are like multiple ways of doing that. Uh, the easy way that I've highlighted in green in that screenshot is uh, on the bottom right we can see some like logging that says, oh, EPROM read fails, so I know that function is responsible for reading EPROM. Uh, but maybe, maybe the firmware you're going to look at is not uh, as uh, verbose. In which case, um, as I said before, like, to read from an EPROM, you know you have to send three over SPI. So if you find like the SPI function and you see like sending three, you know what it is. And that's what I've highlighted in um, yellow. Um, but then like how do you find the SPI function? You know it's kind of a problem. Uh, two ways for that. Um, 
in my case, once again, it was logged, so it was easy. But usually, like the main trick is um, you have this um, something called uh, mapped uh, I/O, a memory mapped I/O. It's this kind of like magic address values in the CPU that, like, if you write to them, it's actually going to send data over like UART or SPI or whatever. If you're lucky, you're going to have a data sheet for the CPU, and it specifies exactly what are those addresses. If you're unlucky, um, you have to guess, and that's really hard. And at that time, maybe you should like look for something else, or just you know you're going to spend a lot of time on that. So we want to uh, patch the EEPROM now, so we can enable the console. The, our plan of action is: we know the read-write commands. Uh, we want to interface with the flash. So to do that, um, uh, sorry, the EEPROM, we we um, we need like a spy uh, device, and we've seen before the bus pirate is a perfect candidate for that. And we need to connect to the chip. Uh, unfortunately, like it's a really tiny one, and so like the clip I was showing are like too big for that. You can buy online some rigs that people make. Um, it's like expensive and it takes like five weeks to get them. So instead, I went kind of crazy and I tried to solder like um, little wires onto the thing, and I was like, honestly, that's never going to work. But it happened to actually work, and I was like, sweet. And uh, it's all like looked like cross because it's like all the flux that remains on that. Um, and that's the code for the bus pirate. It's super like boilerplate uh, thing. And when you just write um, these magic values, that uh, so I was asked to like uh, replace them with like emojis. But uh, the idea is like just after that, you're greeted with console is set to uh, like you are zero. And now we have a lot of more stuff uh, printed on console, which is great. But unfortunately, I get like this hurdle. Like the input are still like not working. I was like trying to press space or type like it's like asking for oh you want to look at root? What's I type nothing happens. Like oh, what happened? Did I just cut the tray so you cannot send data? We have the board, we can look at it. Um, so uh, that's just like like a uh, zoom up on the thing. And at that time, I was like you know looking at the UART pad and start like with my multimeter like trying to beep out like where it goes. You know it's. Following the continuity testing, and eventually it reached some wires like on the right side, and wires are that little hole that connect one side of the board to the other. So the trick is the actual like trace that connects the UR to whatever uh, goes to the other side of the board and goes over back and forth, and it's like really like tedious. And eventually I kind of lost where it was going, but it was kind of under that uh, mod port uh, that's like the keyed uh, RG45. Um, and so. Um, Remember, like the recon side, uh, recon part, um, we have that box, and it's like, oh damn, that's that's a thing. So I kind of went over like my YOLO approach again, where um, I was holding like I had a plug like a jumper cable in my um, the transmit of my FTDI cable, and uh, so I had like this like wire that I could poke around, and on the other side I was like pressing keys on the console, trying to see if something happened, and meanwhile I was poking like to the pins one by one, and I think at the second one it actually worked, and I got greeted by uh, like a wood shell on the device, so that was cool. Um, but the trick was um, the, on the right side I have like a proper setup where I plugged my Ethernet cable into the plug, so at that time I didn't know where the key RG45 was, so I was just like sanded the plastic of the Ethernet cable so I could like shove it in, and yeah it just works, so that was nice. Uh, now that we have a root shell, there's like uh, a lot of debug strings printed on screen, and that's annoying. So um, the trick I was like, I want to kill the process that's like sh that's like floating my console. Uh, there's a watchdog that's going to reboot the device if that happens. So I uh, highlight in the corner like the magic commands that you can run to kill that. It's just like random Linux stuff. Uh, so now we can finally do some vuln research. Um, and really, what you're going to do is like look at process running, poke around, look at open ports. Uh, that's just a bunch of processes, uh, you see cool stuff, but uh, that's when it started getting interesting. I think at some point I was tired of looking in IDA and I was like, I'm going to poke more. And I looked at DH client and I was like, huh. And the really funny part is like, I run DH client and I see this like 2007 copyright. I was like, whoa, that's not a good thing. And if you just run DH client by itself, it's like false. I was like, that's weird. And if you like run it the right way, they print a debug message that say, oh, we modified it to work it better on our device. And I was like, huh, that's interesting. So if we look back uh, and we look for the specific version, it turns out that 10 years ago actually for DEF CON, uh, John Oberheide um, released like an exploit for that specific version of the Edge client. So I was like, oh, that's, that's easy. Um, but we want to make sure that it's actually vul still vulnerable. So the, um, the vuln was like a dumb like um, stack overflow like while handling DHCP options. So we can compare the original source code with the patch source code because DH client is open source. And just to keep in mind, there might be like mitigation, like stack cookies, ASLR, or whatnot. 
So if we look at the vulnerable code on the left side, we can see a mem copy like highlighted in red that's using like data.len as a field, while on the patch version they replace that by four. So the idea is like this bug is uh, subnet, it's a bug in the subnet mask handling, and the subnet mask should be like four bytes. But the way the HTTP option works is that you can send up to like 255 bytes, I think, and it used to just dumbly trust whatever you're sending, which is bad. And if we look in IDA at like the actual like function, uh, we can see there is no stack canary, and the, 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 on the left, on the right side, it's, it's not using that magic four, so it's, it's obviously like still vulnerable. So it's time to exploit stuff. Um, Working on the phone was tedious, so I was like, oh, I'm going to try to set up QMU. Um, if you're not familiar with QMU, it can do like emulation of ARM stuff or like many other systems, and can do either like user land or uh, full system. User land wouldn't work here because uh, DHCP is uh, going to try to modify an IP and stuff, and that's not cool. Um, but instead, we can do, do a full system emulation, and uh, those tutorials tell you how to like set up a cool image for that. And we just want to set up the network properly uh, because we want to interfere with DHCP, and naturally, um, the um, QMU stack would give you a DHCP for yourself, so you have to be say like, don't do that. And yeah. So I run it in, DH in QMU, and after like all this effort, and it's still sick fault. I was like, huh. So it turns out that like have I modified stuff that's actually causing the stack fault? And um, I'm not going to cover that too fast because I'm running like a little bit of time, but uh, basically it's creating that weird socket. Uh, it's like a named socket and uh, so that like the main application, the, the VOIP stack can talk with the edge client and share options. Um, and uh, the idea is like that's like the main application and we can see what it does. That's not, not super interesting. But basically on the left side is like sending data to configure the edge client that startup. And on the right side I re-implemented that in Python. And uh, you can run that with like SOCAT. Um, so SOCAT is just a kind of like netcat in, um, in more like uh, more tools so you can create that name SOCAT. And the idea you run the Python script on the host, you run SOCAT on the, um, the QMU like binary image and that would just work. So now we can start debugging uh, DH client. Um, we can run GDB, we can try to like actually run the POC. Uh, the, I couldn't compile the original proof of concept, it was like using really old tools and it's just like, after like a like, couple of hours like oh fuck that, I'm tired. So instead uh, I use a SCAPI based uh, exploit. SCAPI is a Python library that lets you like you know mess with uh, network packets like at a fairly low level. And um, so now we want to like reach the um, Vulnerable, vulnerable code. So um, I was explaining the bug is in the uh, subnet mask option, and uh, the way DHCP works is like a t tag length value, like type of stuff. So you say, oh, this option is a uh, subnet mask. Here's the length. Here's the value. And obviously, it was like it should be four, but if you send more, it's fine. But for the DHCP specs, and so we can use Scapy for doing that. So uh, that's my like a chunk of my Scapy script, and just the payload in purple is interesting. I'm basically just sending the subnet mask option with uh, data that would be like a a a a b b b b c c c c and so on and so forth, so that uh, when it crashes in GDB, uh, we can see like all the register we control, and we know um, exactly um, you know if we want to affect which register, which chunk of the shell code we need to change. And we can see that we're actually controlling uh, PC, so the program counter, so that's good. We know that we have, um, we can exploit, we have contro control for execution. And there are like a few more details that I'm going to skip over, but um, we need to, scale, uh, to craft a shell code now. Uh, unfortunately, like it looks like the stack is, uh, you cannot execute the stack, so we would have to wrap it, and that's tedious. But um, cool stuff is like if you look for there is like a system call in that binary that I think also Avaya added, and we do control R4. So if we put us if we can put a string in memory in an address we know that could be a valid like system command, and put the, the address in R4 we're good. Um, so if you think about it, DHCP client, DH client, sorry, receive configuration values from the server. So probably there is going to be stuff that are stored somewhere, and um, it turns out that ASLR is disabled. Oh, sorry, I forgot to mention that. Uh, but then we, the idea is like I just send, I start like sending like AAAs as like a bunch of uh, options and look at memory to see if I could find that string somewhere. And eventually the domain option was a good one. And so um, now I can show you uh, a cool demo that's what happened when you actually run the whole stuff. So uh, on, the, um, on the left side we have the phone that's booting. Can I do it? The phone is booting, and the window, uh, the terminal window is like on the left side is a rock DHCP client running on payload, and on the right side is um, it's a web server that uh, will uh, provide like a post exploitation kind of stuff. So we can see the packet is running. To make sure it works, I was uh, cutting uh, dev random on the uh, on the screen, so that's why it looks like noise. 
it's fetching data from the um, web server, and I don't know if you can see, but it's loading like Steve.data. Uh, FYI, like Steve is actually my uh, boss. That's him. <laughs> and uh, just then, I'm uh, still like. I don't know if there's sound, but I'm exfiltrating audio from the main speaker, and you can see it in VLC that when I'm speaking and clapping my hands, it's actually like reading the audio on the attacker laptop. So that's pretty scary because you can turn your um, phone into a um, you know, listening device. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> so, um, yeah, and just FYI, like all the tools I use are like actually already on the phone. Like you have like Netcat, you have like stuff to like dump the audio to like STD in. So you, it's just like writing some shell script, like bash script, whatever. So um, as a conclusion, uh, for mitigation, like you want to make sure you monitor your network so that you don't have like punks like sending uh, you know like weird DHCP packets. And uh, actually, like McAfee uh, firewall, I can detect that. Uh, FYI, you want to segregate your network. Um, to make sure that, for instance, the coffee pot is not able to like send weird DHCP packets to your phone, and make sure IT actually patch your phone because you know it, it's the patch got released like Avaya released the patch like a month ago, so make sure it's actually patched. And uh, if you want to think about why this kind of bug happened, like tec the technical debt is really hard to handle, and you know probably like someone had like in good faith, um, okay, um, someone in good faith um, mm -hmm. forked the stuff and they forget about it. So um, and just as a real quick. Um, embedded systems are not black boxes, so I would just encourage everyone to uh, look at them, and uh, you can do it now as well. So if you have questions, uh, ask me on Twitter or whatever, and thank you for your time, guys.